Hi guys. All right, so um, chapter six of A Stout Hearted Seven. Um, in the last couple chapters, um, Mama had a baby girl, which was awesome, named Rosanna, after Papa's sister. And then yesterday, um, they came to another river that was actually very shallow. It was probably more like a stream that they had to cross. But when they were coming up the embankment on the other side, the wagon tipped over. And um, so that was just one more setback that they've had. So they've they've kind of faced a lot of stuff already um, so far on the trail. So anyway, so chapter six, slowly the travelers moved westward. The rain ceased. In its place came hot July sunshine and dust pouring endlessly up through the cracks in the wagon bed. The prairies were still green, though every day mama said she could see more brown in the grass. Papa said that was a sign it was curing, like meat over a fire. The cattle seemed to do well on it. Mama gained strength every day. Often she sat with Papa on the wagon seat, the baby in her arms, while Matilda and Louise played together just behind her in the space where the beds lay at night. Matilda's knee hurt if she walked much, and Louise was such a wild little thing that Mama would not let either of them out of her sight for long. Catherine and Elizabeth were free most of the time to run along beside the wagon or play with other children. Mama started them out every morning with the sunbonnets tied firmly under their chins. But before long, the bonnets hung down their backs and their hair came unbraided. Their faces grew tanned, their dresses torn and dirty. Mama said, what would people think of her letting her children run wild? Papa said that did not matter. They were healthy and strong as never before. Often he pointed out to Mama that with all her troubles, she had not had malaria this summer. The West was already curing her. John and Frank too ran wild. Their duty was mainly to help herd the cattle behind the column of wagons. They showed up at mealtimes dirty and hungry, Frank's eyes dancing at his latest practical joke. John, as always, more steady and reliable, but ready to fight for his brother if need be. So just a little bit about those characters again. So Louise, the baby, well, the baby before the baby. Um, she's two and a half. She's kind of a spunky little thing. She has tons of personality. Um, John, the oldest brother, is kind of the more serious one. He's very kind of sweet and caring and calming. Um, Frank's kind of a goofball. Frank's really kind of stubborn. He doesn't want to back down. Um, he'll push the envelope a little bit. That's a saying. But um, he's kind of the goofy one. So just a little bit more about their personalities. Often Papa was called to prescribe for some sick person. Catherine saw him smile as he went from tent to tent with his little bag of medicines. This was what he liked best to do. He even pulled teeth now and then using a pair of pliers or a turn screw. Ugh, that doesn't sound fun. They didn't have anything to numb it with either. The last day of July, he announced one night after supper, I wish these long days would last until we get to Oregon. Just look at that sunset. How bright the colors are here on the prairie. Catherine had not thought about that before, but it was true. The dust had settled, so the air was clear, and the sunset stretched all the way around to the north like a great pink veil flung over the sky. In the morning, everyone was shivering. First day of August, fall is coming, Papa said. The captain tells me we should get to Fort Laramie by night. What's a fort, Elizabeth asked. A place where people can go for protection. There are high walls around it so no one can get in once the gates are closed. Will there be Indians near? I suppose so, but they won't hurt us. I'll be glad to see buildings again, Mama said. Will we stop a few days? The captain says not. We've had so many delays, we're way behind schedule. If we don't move right along, we could get caught by a snowstorm in the Blue Mountains. At noon, the wagon train stopped in a beautiful grove beside the North Platte River. The men and boys took a quick swim. Mama rinsed out the baby's diapers as she did whenever they stopped near a stream. After an hour's rest, Captain Shaw ordered the train to move on. They left the river and started over a level, sandy plain. The afternoon grew very warm. It seemed impossible that anyone had felt cold at night. Mama urged the girls to rest for a while with her, and all of them went to sleep except Catherine. She lay awake wishing she could get out of the desk, boiling up through the floor cracks. Moving silently, she crawled to the front and out to the seat. Papa was walking beside the oxen, as he often did. Catherine thought she would like to walk with him. She stepped down to the wagon tongue and jumped as she had done a dozens of times. She had not noticed that Papa's ax had not been pushed clear into the toolbox at the side and the handle stuck out. As she jumped, her dress caught it. Down she went, just behind the hooves of the off ox. She screamed and then everything went black as the heavy wheels passed over her body. The next thing she knew, she was lying in the road behind the wagon. Papa was kneeling beside her and Mama looking down at her, tears running down her face. 
Catherine, baby, Naomi, is she still alive? Of course I am. Catherine tried to sit up and then fell back, the blackness sweeping over her again. Papa lifted her in his arms, staring at her oddly dangling left leg. Oh, my dear child, your leg is broken. And if it's, I think it was pretty badly broken, like snapped in half broken. Min came running and put up the tent, and Papa carried her inside and laid her on a blanket. There's a doctor in the Nick's company. I'll get him, she heard a man say. Papa, you fix my leg, Catherine whispered. He did not reply, but gently began straightening her leg. Catherine screamed with a sudden terrible pain. John and Frank rushed into the tent, panting. What's happened now? John, bring me some of those thin strips of wood inside the wagon, Papa ordered. Naomi, I'll need bandages. Bring a sheet from your chest. It was a bad time for Catherine before the leg lay bandaged in splints to keep it straight. But, but both Papa and Mama praised her for her bravery. The work had just been finished when they heard the pounding of hooves and two men burst into the tent. This is Dr. Dagen, said their neighbor, who had ridden to bring him. Catherine looked up into a face almost covered by a bushy, bushy beard. Two bright blue eyes looked down at her with the kindness that she could feel. The doctor knelt beside her and ran his fingers lightly along her bandaged leg. Wow, just as good as I could have done myself, he said in a thick German accent that I clearly don't have. Elizabeth and Matilda, who had crept into the tent behind him, began to giggle at the strange way of speaking, and Mama hustled them back outside. Papa and the doctor talked in low tones, and then Papa went away for a while and came back carrying a long, narrow box. Now then, Catherine, I've made something to carry your leg in till it's well, he said cheerfully. Mama has padded the inside and will lay your leg in it so the jolting won't hurt so much. Dr. Dagen, let's see if we can get her into the wagon. We've moved things around so there's more rooms for beds. Someone brought a canvas stretcher and slid it under Catherine's small body as Papa lifted her. They carried her to the wagon and placed her in a space that they had cleared at the other end from Mama's bed. That feels better, she whispered, trying to smile as Papa slipped the padded box under her leg. Henry, we don't have to go on today, do we? Mama begged. I'll ask Captain Shaw. When he returned, Catherine heard him talking to Mama outside the wagon. I'm sorry, Naomi. We have only a few hours of travel to reach Fort Laramie. The captain says we must go on. He was seized with a fit of coughing. Your cold is worse, she said. Don't bother about me. I'll be all right. But our poor child, if only I had not let them jump over the wheel. I hope I set that leg right. If I didn't, she may never walk again. Hush, Henry. Catherine lay still. Never walk again? Never run? Never jump again? It can't be. Oh, no. I'll keep quiet. I won't cry or make a fuss. Surely it will get well but if only I had noticed that ax handle. During the short stay at Fort Laramie, Elizabeth looked around and then came to report to Catherine. Just as Papa said, a high log wall with a gate in it. Lots of Indians, but they don't look mean. Dr. Dagen said he would go along with the Sagers for a while to keep a watch on Catherine's leg. He did not have a wagon of his own, but had been paying for a space in another one. So it was very little trouble for him to bring his small bag of clothing and medicine and share the tent at night. I'm very grateful to you, Mama said. My husband is not well, and the boys also seem to be taking cold. Papa protested that he was not sick, but one day he could not get up. The boys, too, were obviously very ill. Dr. Dagen examined them and then said soberly, they all have camp fever. They must stay in bed. He and Mama moved the piles of bedding and clothing and the dwindling sack of supplies, making the wagon a moving hospital. So it says dwindling supplies. Dwindling means like going down. So they're definitely running out of supplies. Every inch of space was taken up by beds now. With Dr. Dagen working night and day with poultices and hot drinks, the sick man and two boys gradually began to recover. From time to time, the whole wagon train had been short, short of supplies, especially meat. And many people wished they had not wasted so much back in Buffalo country. Sorry. Oh my gosh. Sorry, something just popped up. It seemed almost unbelievable then while suddenly one afternoon, a few of the huge animals came galloping clumsily over the prairie. Papa heard the shouts of Buffalo and sprang from bed. Henry, you must not go. You are not strong enough, Mama protested. Dr. Dagen shouted in German something Catherine knew must be the same morning. Papa only said, we need meat, grabbed his gun and jumped from the wagon. Hours later, he dragged himself back, exhausted and dripping with sweat. Before long, he was burning with fever, and Catherine, lying next to him, knew he was terribly sick again. 
The doctor did all he could, but this time his remedies did not help. Every day, Papa grew weaker until Catherine thought she could not stand to hear him groan and feel his body shake with chills. Finally, out of his mind with fever, he began raving about his farm in Missouri. One evening after the train had made camp, Captain Shaw came. How are you feeling, Mr. Sager? I'm dying. Don't say that. You'll pull through. Papa's voice was very weak. Captain Shaw, I've heard about that missionary, Dr. Marcus Whitman, and how people can stay at his place over the winter if they need to. Will you take my wife and children there? Naomi is still weak, and this little one here will be crippled for a long time. Of course I will, Mr. Sager, if you are not up and around by the time we get there. But don't give up hope. Throughout the night, after Captain Shaw's visit, Mama sat by Papa's side, keeping cool cloths on his forehead. But his fever ran so high that Catherine could feel the heat of it through the blankets. Toward morning, she fell asleep. And when she awakened, Mama was pulling a sheet up over Papa's face. Is he better, Mama? Mama had a wild look in her eyes. She hardly seemed to know what she was saying as she whispered, Henry, if only we had stayed in Missouri. They had camped that night on the banks of the Green River, a beautiful place, Elizabeth told Catherine. Captain Shaw ordered some of the men to cut down one of the cottonwood trees along the bank. They split it and hollowed out the pieces to make a coffin for Papa, and a minister traveling with them read the funeral service. Catherine could hear most of it from her bed. Don't cry, Katie, said Elizabeth, who had stayed with her. Papa would like to be in such a lovely place under these trees. I wish I could see it, Catherine replied. Write it in the Bible that Papa died on the 28th of August. After Elizabeth had gone, she could no longer keep from crying. Oh, Papa, she sobbed, and then it seemed as if he spoke to her. Be brave, set a good example for the others. So she did not so She did not want to be brave, but she had promised him, so she wiped her eyes. When Mama came into the wagon and lay down beside her, she whispered, We'll make it, Mama. We'll get to Oregon as Papa wanted. I'm getting better, and I'll soon be up to help you. Oh, Katie, what would I do without you? Okay, so um, that is the end of chapter six. So unfortunately, um, Papa did not um, did not make it, um, which is very sad. Um, he was very sick and he was probably more sick than anyone else because um, he had the least amount of sleep and was working the hardest. I mean, he was driving the wagon, he was hunting, he was probably standing guard at nighttime and all the things that um, the women were not doing. Um, so anyway, um, he did not make it. So that's a very sad ending to chapter six.